What's up, Kicking Lawyer crew? So uh, it's Jerry Mason again, the Kicking Lawyer, and today we're going to talk about uh, the title of the video, of course, is Kiki Doesn't Love You Anymore, but it's really going to talk about some of the uh, nuances of divorce. I'm not going to go in super detail on it, but I thought I'd give you a general overview so that if you're um, entering a point in your life where you're in a relationship and you've decided that that is um, the direction you want to go, that uh, you, you have some general information at least um, about the subject of divorce. The first thing I would say is that uh, uh, I am anti-divorce, even though our, our firm here does do divorce work. I am very pro-marriage. I'm a sort of a traditionalist when it comes to that. And I say that even though I myself have been divorced once and am remarried since. Um, but especially if you have children, I think you need to seriously consider the children and you know try counseling and therapy, uh, whatever may work. Now, there's, of course, exception to this. <clears throat> if you're in an abusive relationship, you know, the, the, regardless of anyone else's interest, you have to protect your own interest and maybe get out. But, but short of something like that, if it's a possibility that you may be able to work things out with your spouse, I recommend that you do that. So seek counseling or whatever. So that'd be number one is try to work things out. But if you know that it's not going to work out, you're at the end of your rope and you're going to have to move forward with divorce, um, then I'm going to give you this general overview. Keep in mind that the advice I'm going to give you is based on Tennessee law. Um, although other states share similar principles, um, this is focused primarily on Tennessee law. It is for entertainment purposes only, so take it as you will. And you, uh, you definitely need to seek out a um, quality, uh, skilled, and licensed attorney in your area to help you. Of course, our firm stands ready to assist you on this. We have done many divorces. But generally, I look at divorces in... Uh, in like three different phases. So phase one is you have to have some sort of grounds. In Tennessee, that's relatively an easy phase. Uh, you know, you have something called irreconcilable differences that's quasi uh, uncontested divorce in Tennessee. But uh, there are multiple other grounds in Tennessee, adultery, uh, inappropriate marital conduct, uh, one of the parties being arrested for a long, in prison for a long period of time, various things like that, different types of abuse, things can be grounds for divorce. Generally, divorces may start contested and ultimately can be granted on the, um, the sort of uncontested grounds of irreconcilable differences, but e each one is sort of unique on how that works. Again, it may take a lot of lawyering um, or uh, advocating for you by your attorney to work towards an agreement, but, but a lot of them, uh, the majority of them, I would argue, end up uh, being granted based on irreconcilable differences. Regardless of the, uh, the avenue that they're started, most attorneys will file a divorce based on two grounds. Um, and that's for some legal purposes, but it's mainly so that if ultimately one party is avoiding service, you could get what's called a default judgment. So anyway, grounds have to be uh, pled in the complaint. Complaint has to be served uh, or wait. You can have the opposing party waive service. And the, the filing of the, um, the uh, petition for divorce is what gets the ball rolling for or the complaint for divorce is what gets the ball rolling for um uh, the divorce to proceed. Now, in Tennessee, if you're married with children, the divorce cannot be final for 90 days. So you have to wait 90 days, even if everybody agrees to everything for a chancellor to grant the divorce. And if you if uh, you are married without children in Tennessee, it's 60 days. So those are the time frames to look at. Now, that's assuming that everything's agreed to, everything's paid, all the other hoops are jumped through, parent class is completed, all this kind of stuff. So Anyway, that's that's the initial filing and grounds that we've pled in the filing, and that's pretty much the the basis for the beginning of it. As you work through it, um, one of the there, there are two other points that are uh, points of contention in a divorce. One of them is the dissolution of the property or disbursement of the property, um, and that's handled through a, a document called a marital dissolution agreement, usually in Tennessee. And what it does is it allocates for the division of assets and liabilities property, retirement accounts, pensions, anything like that that has any type of value or debt associated with it is usually resolved via the, the MDA. Now, generally, it's supposed to come out and be what's called equitable. So it's be an equitable uh, disbursement or division of the marital assets and liabilities uh, when, uh, when the M MDA is, is finalized. It doesn't have to be exactly equal, so that's something to keep in mind. It doesn't have to be an exactly equal break. Now, another thing the MDA uh, allocates for is alimony. You have a lot of clients come in and question about that. One party hasn't been making any money or as much money as the other party, and um, 
they want to they're going to be able to get some alimony. You know, alimony is it is uh, granted in Tennessee. Tennessee tends to disfavor long term alimony, um, but generally there there can be some award of alimony. There, there's no set rule on when there there are factors the court looks at. But there's no set time frame of a marriage on when the court is going to look at and determine if alimony is appropriate. Generally, I tell clients if you're around the 10-year mark, eh, it's possible, especially if you have a very uh, economically depressed uh, uh, spouse versus uh, another spouse that makes a lot of money. So, you know, just just keep that in mind if you're on the cusp of eight, nine, ten years, especially past that point, alimony could be an issue. Uh, but there's ways to handle it, too, where al- there, there's sort of alimony paid, but it's not paid and called alimony. Like you can do lump sum alimony, or it could maybe uh, be figured where there's a bigger payoff on one portion of the property settlement. Like maybe there's some cash they get or more por- part of a retirement or something like that. There's various things you can do to work on it if alimony is a big point uh uh, of contention or an area that that you know either party stressing about. <clears throat> so the MDA handles um, all of the stuff that's marital assets. Uh, one other point I would say real quick: what's a marital asset? Well, generally in Tennessee, anything purchased after the marriage, rather who, regardless of whose name it's in, is a marital asset. So if you buy a car and it's in somebody's name, and one one specific say the husband has bought the car and the husband it's in the husband's name and he's paid for the car but he bought it during the course of the marriage, it's a marital asset. That means both parties have some equity interest in it, possibly. Generally, anything you had before marriage is not a marital asset. Now, this is kind of a loose rule, too, because you can get what's called commingling. That's where, okay, say you bought a car before the marriage, and then in the course of the marriage, it's being paid for. And even though it was purchased before the marriage, but there's a lien on it, one party, the other the other party, let's use the, the husband example again, say it's a husband and a wife, Husband bought the car before the marriage. Uh, the car has been getting paid on during the marriage. Well, the, the wife has an argument that she has some equity interest in it because even if she didn't work and pay any of that through through money, even if she was a homemaker, she she provided support so that the husband could make the money and work and pay for that. So um, uh, that that's something to keep in mind that especially the longer the marriage goes on, the more, more likely there's a possibility of commingling of assets, even premarital assets. So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, if there's any real property, homes, uh, vacation homes, land, anything like that, cars, trucks, motorcycles, boats, um, all those things are going to be resolved in the marital dissolution agreement. It will outline in detail all the all the all those factors and get them resolved. The next point of major contention contention is if you have children, uh, custody and visitation rights, child support and whatnot. And the, there's a permanent parenting plan that is usually used in Tennessee. Uh, sometimes some, some um, jurisdictions use um, the, the decree and the MDA sort of have in, uh, included in them uh, some visitation language and scheduling, uh, visitation scheduling issues and child support issues and stuff like that. Uh, a lot of the jurisdictions, though, do two separate documents where you have the MDA and then you have the uh, uh, parenting plan. And the parenting plan can have... Uh, it outlines the custody, which is uh, legal custody is the decision-making power of the parents. And then it outlines physical custody, which is the visitation rights. That's, you know, every other weekend or every other week or however the visitation is set up. And then it also allocates under the Tennessee statute for uh, child support, the child support guidelines. You can go online and look at those. Um, and you can, it's really simple to calculate. I mean, it's it's way different than alimony. People are like, well, how much alimony do you have to pay? Well, maybe none. I don't know. I mean, it's it's really what we can negotiate and argue. Um, but on child support, it's figured. Like child support is set in Tennessee. There's certain guidelines we have to go by. And it's real simple. You put in your income, the opposing party's income, and the number of days of visitation you have. And then it spits out a uh, uh, amount that one party is going to have to pay. It's usually the party... The party that pays child support is usually the party that makes the more money but sees the children less or some variation thereof. It is possible to, to sort of play with the numbers if it's all agreed to and get it down to, to nothing, uh, like almost a zero imputed uh, child support, but that's usually very rare and it's only when the parties are very close in days of visitation or close in the amount of money they make. Uh, but there are things you can do if you have a good lawyer to try to work around some of that if you're really concerned with it. Ultimately, child support is the child's right. The child support belongs to the child. Um, Tennessee doesn't do anything where you the either party or the party receiving the child support has to keep any records of where that money goes. 
you know, so that's a whole other argument on what you think about child support. But uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, that is the case. They just they have a right to get the money and then use the money to benefit the child however they see fit, paying rent, paying electric bills. Of course, some people are going to argue they paid you that coach purse or whatever, but um, that that's just the nature of how child support works. And one other last thing I would say to consider on, you know, obviously divorces can get expensive, especially if they're hotly contested and you do want a good advocate in your corner. But there's other things that pop up that can possibly increase the cost of a divorce. Some attorneys like to do depositions if they're very contested and there's some fact issues they want to get out. They may depose a client or, a, a, I'm sorry, the opposing client or other witnesses. And depositions is where a court reporter comes in and takes the testimony, sworn testimony of, of um, one party where the attorney will question them, similar to if they were in court. Um, and then there's a cost associated with that. Obviously, you pay your attorney to be there, but then you also have to pay for the court reporter to do the transcript of the deposition. So that can increase cost. Uh, there's a parenting class Tennessee requires you to go to. It's not very expensive, but that's something else that you have to pay to go to. And then sometimes, uh, especially if it's contested, in our area anyway, they usually order us to mediation. Mediation is uh, where you go to a neutral party, often an attorney, but it's usually someone licensed as a mediator, and they will go between the parties. You would be there with your attorney, opposing parties there with their attorney, separate rooms usually. Mediator goes back and forth and tries to negotiate a deal um, on all the, po all the points. Sometimes through mediation, you can have an agreement on one of the issues, like say the property issues in the MDA, but maybe reserve the visitation and custody issues for um, the judge to make the decision on. The last thing that I would say about divorce is, uh, especially from personal experience of being through one myself, is you know you don't they don't have to be uh, so emotion based and difficult. They are. I mean, it's inherently an emotion based. Uh, deal, but um, you know they don't have to be. If you go into it and look at it almost like a business exchange, which is really what it is, it's a, uh, a breach of contract type ordeal, for lack of a better term. Um, but it's from somebody that you've built a life with, especially if it's you know any length of time on the marriage can make it much more difficult. I highly recommend though that if at all possible you get an agreement in mediation. Worst case, you know, and the reason is because if not, you're leaving. The, uh, the the division of your life that you've accumulated this this far and the visitation of your children, the time you should get with your kids, in the hands of someone that doesn't know any of you. Um, the judges that I know are usually very good. They're usually very fair. You should try to be very reasonable, uh, judges and chancellors. But, you know, they don't know you. And you only get that potentially one, two days in court, however long the hearings are, to sort of put on the proof about stuff that could have ha gone on for 10 or 20 or 50 years. Um, and I don't know that that's the wisest thing to do is to leave it in the hands of someone that doesn't doesn't know you. Obviously, the people that are going to know the best thing for your children are you and your spouse. And I, I think that you know that one of the most adult things you can do is put aside your grievances and try to come to an agreement that's really good for them. If you're both good parents, well, you know, don't try to use the divorce against each other as a stick to beat each other with. You know, try to come out with an agreement that's going to be in everybody's best interest, including the children, or I should say, especially the children. So anyway, that's my two cents. Uh, not a super long video, but if you have specific questions, you can always shoot me an email at the email num email below, or you can give us a call at the number and set up a consultation. We'd be glad to help you. Our firm specifically services West Tennessee and Arkansas. So if you give us a call, we'll uh, try to help you in those areas. Um, and then, you know, let me know what you think about the videos. Give me some comments. Uh, subscribe if you get a second, uh, like the video, share the videos. I appreciate all that support. So uh, if anything else comes up, feel free to give us a shout. And until next time, this is Jerry Mason, The Kicking Lawyer. Thanks for watching.